Freiburg today, we have Emma Seppala. Thank you so much for being here. The happiness track just came out. How does one get happy? It seems like our life is full of stress. Well, we have this misconception that in order to be successful, we have to postpone or even sacrifice our happiness. But when you look at the research, you see that that's absolutely not the case. So I've been looking at the data for the last 10 years and seeing that if you prioritize your happiness, that actually will make you more creative, more productive, more charismatic, a number of things that people are looking for. Now we should talk about, you have three Ivy League degrees. Mm -hmm. Talk about stress. Yale, Columbia, and Stanford. You're so young. How have you found the key to happiness so quickly? Well, it was precisely being in these high achieving environments that I saw people who were successful on the one hand, but really burning out on the other. And when I dove into the research, I saw that that just doesn't have to be the case. We're buying into myths of success that are counterproductive and that are burning us out. If you look across industries, 50% or more people are burning out. How did it come into a book form? How did you decide, I'm going to write about happiness? Because everybody's talking about this. Mm -hmm. You can take classes in this at Harvard. You said you started a center in Stanford to talk about happiness. So everybody's trying to figure out this happiness thing. You write a book. How, how did this happen? Well, there was a lot of interest, and that's why we started a class um, at Stanford. And it, it was precisely to address that need among the students, these extremely talented students, and yet, they weren't necessarily happy. There were three suicides the first year that I was there as a PhD student. That was really troublesome to me. Here we were in this perfect environment, and yet people were in, in such a state of despair, really. And again, if you look at the research, you see that happiness is the secret to a lot of the things we're looking for. If we take more time off, for example, we become more creative, more innovative, and have more breakthrough ideas. Let's talk about your childhood a little bit. You, you talked about your, your, your uh, folks are in Paris. Mm -hmm. You speak many languages. Was it a trip to China that changed all of this and you decided this is what I'm going to talk about, this is what I'm going to make my life's work? It was precisely that. So growing up in France, then moving to the United States to go to college, and then going to China, I kept seeing so many different kinds of people and also different happiness levels. And in particular, I noticed that I, sometimes people had everything and yet they weren't happy. And in other places, they had nothing and they were full of bliss. So that really made me very curious as to what really brings about human fulfillment. What do you say to the person who is a workaholic because if I just work really hard, I'm gonna get to where I wanna get and then I'm gonna be really happy. And the people who never take the vacations that they're allotted because mm -hmm. they're afraid that, gosh, if I take vacation, I'm not gonna be that person I wanna be. Right, well in terms of vacation, the United States has less vacation days than any other country. But despite that fact, most Americans don't take all of their vacation days. And 91% of people who do take some vacation days are checking their work email during that time. So you're really looking at a problem. There's this idea that you have to be constantly working, constantly focusing. But if, again, if you look at the research, it's detachment from work that makes you feel more engaged. It's being able to take time to be idle, to daydream, to do different kinds of things, different activities that makes you more creative and innovative. And it's being kinder to yourself that in the end makes you more resilient and makes you more likely to learn from mistakes and grow. When people read your book, are they gonna get to the end and say, I can try this, I can try this, I can try this. Is it a primer for happiness? Well, I have put in a lot of practical tips because it's one thing to know something, and, but that's not really useful. And I really want people to be able to take this home and, and just start implementing right away. What's the big thing they're gonna take from this book that they can change in their life right now to make them happier? Well, in the, in the large picture, the idea of taking care of themselves, but also of taking care of other people, it, that's going to lead to greater success for them. So that's kind of the overall view. But in terms of some basic things that they can do, I talk a lot about the fact that we can't change our environment. So most of us can't change our job, can't change our work responsibilities, can't change the pace of our lives because that's just how things are set up. There's a lot of pressure. But what we can change is the state of our mind. So how resilient are we in the face of that? And I talk about a lot of things, but one thing I share, for example, is um, breathing, which can sound very simple, but I've worked with arguably the most stressed individuals in our society, veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan with trauma, who've tried everything, who've tried pharmaceuticals and therapy. It hasn't worked for them. And we did a breathing intervention, a week-long breathing intervention um, called Sudarshan Kriya, and that it's a yoga-based um, practice. And what we found was that in one week, 
they were able to sleep again, their anxiety scores had dropped. And we found that those improvements lasted one month and then one year out. So really breathing is something that is so simple and yet really powerful. So that's getting people to slow down, even during your work day, even during the most stressful times of getting a paper in or, or completing a task at work. Just slow down, stop a second, Actually, if we do take pauses, even mini pauses, because most of us don't have a lot of time, it will make a big impact on your decision making, on your emotional intelligence and your reactions to people, and also on your productivity and focus. Why is it so hard for society to be happy? Why can't we figure that out? Well, many people equate happiness with pleasure. And by pleasure, I mean anything from like sensory pleasures, you know, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, to things like money, achievement, awards. We keep thinking that these material things are going to somehow give us that happiness we're looking for. And they do give us a temporary joy. They give us a little burst of happiness, but it doesn't last. So the, there's a whole other element to what can bring us happiness, and that's a life that's got a greater purpose to it, that has a sense of meaning, that has um, a sense of service beyond just to oneself. And when, that, when you implement those kinds of things into your life, you see a much longer lasting sort of happiness. And I would even call it fulfillment. Why is it, do you think, that our um colleges and universities and our Ivy Leagues across the country are putting happiness classes into um, not requirements and perhaps it should be a requirement but they are available to take and you said you were instrumental in getting one at Stanford. Yes, I th really think it's uh, coming from the students themselves because here they are, they've worked really hard, they know that they can achieve and that they should achieve and yet they've never learned how to be happy. And I'll tell you one story of a Stanford student who came up to um, the instructor who helped me, who uh, she and I started the happiness class together. She came up to the instructor and said, I've got to drop out of the class because it goes against everything I've ever learned. So my friend Carol Portofsky, she's head of health promotion at Stanford, said, well, why? What do you mean? And she said, well, my parents told me that I needed to be very, very successful. So I asked them, well, how do I be very, very successful, and they said, you have to work very, very hard. And so then she asked, well, how do I know if I'm working hard enough? And they said, you have to be suffering. And it's, it's such an intense message, and yet people are really believing this, you know, not just students, but people in general. And it's, it's that a really- That sounds terrible. It's a really sad fact. And that's one of the reasons, too, that I feel such an urgency for people to hear this message. Happiness can sound like this soft and fuzzy topic, and yet it's such an urgent need right now. I think we're seeing, not just among college students, but high school students, that there's this incredible pressure. I often get questions from mothers and fathers who are saying, I want my child to get into Harvard, but I also see that they're really stressed. And in a sense, if we really look at the data, if the children are happier, they're going to do better and they're also going to be more balanced. So how do we change society though? How do we, how do we, because that's flipping a lot of things when we have our kids in preschool at two mm -hmm. and they're going, going, going and they're stacked up like planes over, you know, Chicago with all these after school activities. So how do, how do we change that? Well, in many ways, our culture is driven by the Puritan work ethic, this idea that you're, worth, you're only as worthwhile as your productivity. And it's, it's also determined by we're an immigrant culture and our ancestors were hardworking, industrious people. So it's something that's in the air. However, um, this is the reason I wrote the happiness track is to show the data. If you should just listen to the data. If we take better care of ourselves, if we take moments to pause, we will be more creative, we will be more productive, we will be more focused. It goes against the grain, but again, it's science. And it goes from A to B, if you just do certain key things, certain correct? Certain key things, yeah. Where do you hope to be with the happiness track in five or 10 years from now? As an author, as a well-educated woman, as a mom, as a wife, where do you hope to be with this? Well, I have a lot of organizations approaching and asking me to speak or even consult with them because they're seeing that employees are not very happy. And a lot of employers um, and leaders are implementing these material perks from bonuses to stay at home, work from home days to all sorts of material perks. But again, if you look at the data, what the data shows is that what employees want most of all is to be happy at work and happiness is determined by their relationships with other people. So as a leader, it's more worthwhile for you to get to know your employees, to find out how they're doing, to be there for them when they're not well or when their family's not well, 
that is more worth your time than spending money on a lot of programs and other things. And again, uh, research shows that employees prefer a place where they're happy than to work for a place that gives them a higher paycheck. Amen. <laughs> Emma Seppala, thank you so much for coming on, and I can't wait to see how you do with this book. Thank you so much, Anne. You're welcome. Spend all night kissing and if one was right here then who else is missing? Got a little sidetrack to find my solution Find the keys to the door but it's also a metaphor Keeps keep locked to the grocery store of my mind Just the same time I skip right ahead to the last ride The harder we look the less we can see Don't you know, you know, you know that you need me